Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. And this year, 2019, we have uh, is an anniversary year of the landing of uh, the first people on the moon. And um, uh, I still I remember that time. I don't remember the moon landing itself, but I remember as a small child looking up to the moon trying to understand what exactly had happened. And so uh, in the meantime, since the moon landing, a lot of new uh, information has come out uh, about the moon landing, especially about the lunar guidance computer, which you get some glimpses of here during in this, uh, in this scene that you're seeing here on your screens. Uh, uh, there, is, uh, there was a, a computer, a single computer on the, on the descent module. And there was one on the command module. Module that was uh, that was in orbit around the moon, and um, and uh, the those two computers were running uh, different uh, versions of software. One was of course for the orbiter for the command module, and one was for the uh, descent module that uh, that uh, which eventually landed on the moon. And so the, we even have access today to the software that uh, was running inside the guidance computer of, uh, of the descent module. And uh, we have the full source code and we have it also uh, nicely commented and documented by one of the main people who wrote the software, uh, one of the main programmers. There were many, of course, but the person who was particularly involved with the lunar uh, landing software called Luminary is a very interesting engineer called Don Isles and I just recently connected with him and uh, let's look for for a video that there is about, uh, about him and the software the lunar landing software Don Isles Apollo so if you search for Don Isles on, uh, on YouTube you will find this video and he walks us through uh, his paper copy of the software that ran inside this lunar guiding guidance computer the apollo guidance computer and he wrote quite a lot of it as you can see here that's actually a very nice picture uh, this is printed of course on you know that i have a kind of a fetish for mainframe prints by now i think a lot of people know and so i was of course immediately drawn to this video when i saw that because it shows this uh, code uh, written in an assembler which I don't know because that's uh, the assembler of the of the guidance computing architecture which is somewhat similar to the has some similarities to the S360 uh, architecture but not that many so I, I can't read the assembler but for me it's very interesting that uh, you can see this is, was printed on a 1403 uh, IBM 1403 printer on a, probably on either an S360 or an IBM 1401 mainframe, even though I don't think that NASA had many 1401s, but they definitely had a bunch of IBM um, S360 model 95s in uh, Houston. And so why do I know this is a 1403? For me, the T always gives it away. As you can see here, the T is just a small crossbar and then the longer bar of the of the uh, of the T itself, and there is no any artifacts at all. It's a very simple chain. As you can see the T's here. Uh, that kind of always for me those gives it a give it away, and the zeros as well. Uh, those very nicely oval, but with with a particular length to it. And so I have always loved this uh, this font. And as I said, now we can also get on GitHub. The, up, the full Apollo 11 software and if you search for that we can find the software of the guidance computer and we have Comanche which is the command module software and Luminary which is the lunar landing software itself and uh, so what I thought is that I would like to get uh, the full repository here upload it on a mainframe and then print it out on a 1403 uh, green stripe fan fold paper uh, so that we can have the full look. Now, I do have a matrix printer, a 15 by 11 inch paper matrix printer that can load green stripe fan fold paper, which I have uh, in, my, in my office and I can print stuff there. But unfortunately, I cannot print out 1403 font 
uh, on a matrix print because it's just ASCII and so I cannot give it any any font and uh, the rendering of fonts even if I would would be because it's only nine pin matrix would be uh, wouldn't look very good so I thought that what we could do is upload this old software the Apollo lunar landing software let me give you one remark here by the way um, one nice thing here we can look at there's this very famous uh, thing that happened during the first lunar landing where there was an error 1202 being uh, put out by the guidance computer and then during this video we'll go and see what happened there exactly because in the software we'll find what throws that error but let's just look at any um, any kind of uh, uh, landing analog displays okay so here's the source code let's make it a little bigger um, of uh, of the software that shows on the display what's going on during the landing so you can see here this is assembler this is um, uh, the assembler of the guidance computer it had only if I am correct it only had two registers but the, I have a book about it and I need to I, I don't re I read it I don't remember the architecture very well but there were banks of memory because there were only there was only so much memory could address you could switch memory banks um, and so uh, add uh, address memory in the different banks and that's why sometimes you see banks uh, being mentioned uh, here, like here right? there's nothing to do with a money bank this is a memory bank anyway you would have to read on that but our goal for this video is to uh, put it bring this all up uh, this whole repository on the mainframe and then print it out in nice beautiful 1403 font on green stripe fanful paper uh, how do we do that first of all I went and some people know that I actually bought um, the 1403 font for Windows. Uh, some people sell that and if I look for Kellum 1403 font, uh, here's this person with whom I've had very interesting conversations. Jeff sells the 1403 vintage font for $90. It's a little steep for a font, but um, if you have, it even does it in Hebrew. <laughs> it's very nice, and in Russian. Um, but if you have a passion for things, then ninety dollars is something that uh, can be afforded. And so I went. The, you can also have the limited subset for forty, but I got the uh, the full one for uh, ninety dollars. So I have it and uh, downloaded it. And the, here's the font, as you can see here, the T's kind of the giveaway for me of uh, the 1403 font I will install it now so it's installing the font in my computer and now it's installed okay so the next step will be how do we get this into the mainframe uh, we'll deal with the font later but for now let's get the repository into the mainframe so I have a connection here to my uh, Linux uh, jump um, computer I have like a, a virtual machine with Linux that I always first connect to when I have to do Linux stuff. And, um, and we're gonna go and get um, the repository from GitHub. So um, here it is. Let's go and copy the whole repository. Where is it? Yeah, here it is. So let's copy the link of the repository. And then we just say git clone and the repository Apollo 11. Oops, that's it. That was incredibly fast. Well, so let's start with printing out the luminary with the light, the guidance uh, software for the lander, for the for the descent module. So if you go in here, we see we have all the all the software this is it this is the whole software and what happened is actually somebody took the prints and tried to do OCR didn't work and then typed uh, I think 14 15 years ago somebody typed the whole software in by hand and uh, we're talking about a lot of lines so um, let's actually see how many lines he had to type so yeah 65,000 lines uh, that's uh, that's a lot of typing um, and then uh, when he first tried to compile it because there is actually an assembler for it that we can run on Windows and I think even Linux 
it actually assembled uh, correctly the first time, so there were no spelling mistakes whatsoever. So we know this is the correct software. That's why this makes it so important on this very uh, important year, um, in the 50th anniversary of the landing of the first uh, man on the moon, um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. So uh, let's get this out. Now, one problem that you see here is that this files are much too long to put on on a mainframe, right? Uh, we only uh, we don't have such long file names, so we have to make this shorter, and then we need to decide where we're going to put it. So let's go uh, here. I have a ZOS instance. I'm connected to the ZOS mainframe. Uh, let's go and create a repository, a luminary source. Okay, let's create this, and we make it. 10 megabytes. Uh, let's make it 15. Direct to blocks 40, FB 80, and then made, let's make this a library so we don't have to compress it. Okay, so Mushix Luminary Source. Uh, let's see how we're going to put this up into this uh, data set. This will be this one. Of course, right now it's empty, but um, it's ready to receive it. The first thing we need to do is we need to make this file names something which the which the mainframe can accept, and so we need to make it much shorter. And uh, I think the way that we're going to make this shorter is by giving each file a random number and appending a letter or uh, putting a letter before the number because file names cannot start with a number. Or member names cannot start with a number in ZOS, so we just put a letter in front of it, and uh, and this should just very nicely make all the files unique. And of course, we lose the title, um, but in the print, we're not going to print the title anyway. So how do we do that? So there is in Linux um, there is a a way to produce a random number if you just say random. It will just produce any random number, and of course, it takes the random is taken from. Uh, there should be a random device here. Uh, well, maybe not in this version, uh, but uh, we can see that every time we do that, it's a different number. But it's always between one and ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine. But we don't have this many files, and if there is a collision, uh, the we can put in the script so that uh, it will catch this condition. So let's write a little, a little, a little um, script uh, that does this. So uh, well, let's make it a bash script, which, as you know, I, I don't like bash so much for scripting because it's a very, very uh, slow shell. And it's not so not 100% uh, POSIX compliant, but uh, let's do like this. Uh, was it AGC? Do move the file which we so we go through the directory for every file called AGC, every source file. We move it into uh, first. Let's copy it so we can see copy it into uh, random done um, the only thing is that uh, since we cannot have just numbers as member names let's just put an L for luminary here okay so this should now if we execute this will all the source files will become um, L and the random number so uh, yeah, they're all called AGC. So, bash uh, temp convert. Let's see what happened. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, this looks like it converted it nicely, and we didn't get any error messages from duplicate file names. So that's that's good. So. Um, or would it? Maybe we would just copy over it again. So I think what we need to do is count the number of files and then see if we have the same amount. Um, so let's go and do this. 
Mm. Let's start again from scratch. And let's go get the, the GitHub again. Okay, copy it. Git pull and let's get it down again. Okay. Uh, oops. Hmm. Why is it? Oh. Okay, here it is. So let's count how many files we have. 91. And so now let's run the conversion again, but this time let's move. So we don't have to. Okay. So now we do bash uh, temp convert. And let's count again, 91. So there were no conflicts. So all the files are there. They're now just called L and something. And uh, this is something that we can now upload directly to the mainframe, which is... Uh, okay. So now, of course, we need to set, first of all, ASCII, because we're uploading ASCII into EPSIDIC. Then the second thing we need to do is prompt off. And then we go to Moshake's Luminary Source, which is this data set here, right? Okay, and now we just say input all. And uh, this will work now a little bit. So we're doing 22 megabytes per second, which is not bad. And we should be almost done. 91 files, as we know. Um, let's go see what's going on here. Yes there okay oh well, they're there but it looks like the formatting has been ruined why why do we have these dots here so yep so they're up there However, it looks like uh, it's removed the formatting is just not the same um, orbital integration if you look at that on the let's go here luminary orbital into what is it orbital something let's go here to orbital integration so we're not quite there. I mean, this is how it should look. Let's make it a little bigger. And so we have the usual bank delete. So it looks like it replaced this blanks. So we're, we're, this is actually not, not satisfactory yet. We need to upload it so that the formatting is preserved. Okay, so I did some uh, researching without uh, boring you with all the lengthy uh, thinking breaks in between and I found out several things. Number one is that if you look at any um, source code here there's a bunch of tabs. So you can see from here you see so when I go here I do right cursor it jumps to this position because there's a tab and so tabs of course uh, is almost unpredictable in the way that's being handled when it's going to be going to be put up. And one thing to understand is every time you have ASCII to EBCDIC translation, there's a code page uh, that's that's going to be used 
by somebody. So it could either be the FTP server, the FTP client, it could be uh, the storage uh, um, uh, handling. So it's, it's kind of unpredictable how the tabs here are going to be used. So what I think, what I, what I did is, first of all, I removed all the tabs in all the source code. So I have, again, a very simple script program within a, with a set uh, recipe here that removes all the tabs with white spaces and writes the files again now with a T for the tab. Um, and if we put this up now, let's see what the result is. Oh, and then one more thing is I removed all the trailing uh, white spaces. So um, if you look at this, I then also removed all the trailing white spaces at the end of the lines. So every, li every line ends with the last printable character. Uh, so we can try now to put this up on the mainframe. So let's see what comes out. Okay, so uh, ASCII prompt off. <coughs> Excuse me. And we go to Moshik's uh, luminary source. And we say and put multiple put all the detapped ones. Okay, so now it's doing that. While it's doing that, let me show you something fun. Um, let's go into this directory. Somebody wrote a fluid dynamics application. that's in ASCII. So this is like water and it shows the behavior. And they actually has, it's a, a, some person in Japan, Jindo, uh, oops. Okay, this other nice, is um, endo one funnel. Just something funny. Look at endo, you can find it on GitHub somewhere. There's more. Um, we can use pour out. Yeah. And the funny thing is that Endo itself, the program is in C, but it's in obfuscated C. So, and it's also written itself in this fluid um, shape here. So, but this is re this is value um, valid C code, just highly obfuscated as you can see, but it works. Um, so this is fluid dynamics. I mean, this is real fluid dynamics and it's highly obfuscated. I mean, this is work of genius. When you see genius, you recognize it and you have to, and you have to uh, praise it. Uh, so let's step back here. It looks like this went through. And, oops, let's see. Now we can take any one of those. We can see it's better it's much better than the one before, but I would say still not perfect. So we can try to print this out. Now, how do we print this? Uh, all we have to do here in this case is we start Herc print, which is um, this uh, very nice printing application by uh, Fish, who's the one of the two or three top contributors to the Hercules project. Uh, Fish, SDL, Herc, print. I've spoken about this utility before. Herc, print, you pay, I think, it's like $19 to buy it. Oh, here it is, uh, $15. It's probably, the, if you do a lot of mainframe stuff, this is the best $15 you've ever spent. Uh, it produces beautiful output and we're going to get 
a, a, a sample out of that. So it's very simple to install. Installs on Windows, unfortunately, only. Um, and but I think it can also be installed on Wine on Linux. And then once you install that, you launch. Oh, here it is. And you just tell it to which um, internet address to connect, which port, and then you give it the um, the formatting option. So. Let's say I want to have green bar as it was um, in the Don Isles video. I want to embed the font, and now we can use the font that I bought, the 1403 Vintage. You see here, so I can use this font. I embed the font, and that's important because in PDF you can embed the font, uh, which is, in, or you cannot. If you don't, then only you will be able to. Only the the same computer that has the font installed will view the PDF with the correct font. Everybody else will use their default font, font on their computer. So there, that's why you have to embed the font into the into the PDF so that other people also see it in 1403. Okay. Now there's a lot of um, PDF viewers out there, cheap ones, which will not handle the embedded fonts correctly. Uh, Linux may be chief among them, uh, but if you have a good PDF viewer such as uh, uh, Google Chrome, the browser, will, which also opens PDFs, of course, then it will render correctly. Okay, so we're connected now, and uh, we can now make this, well, let's put it here, and keep an eye on here, because when we have incoming print jobs coming from the class A on ZOS, uh, I will, we will receive them here and it will say that it's working on it and since we're going to now have a very big print job we're going to print all these members out uh, it's going to it's going to work on this here a little bit so keep an eye on this and we go out now we could use a we could use an IEB Jenner to print out this uh, PDS that would be that would be one way um, or I can think of probably <laughs> five six different ways to print this out but one of the easiest ones is just write in p and it's going to work on it a little bit but it'll print out all the 91 source files as you can see here it's working on it and keep an eye on this uh, as soon as we so for when you're an interactive tso and you print out something it only sends it out to print once you log out because it needs to process the sys out of the tso logon procedure right so I think I think that's obvious, right? So uh, so we'll we'll finish this and then we'll we'll log off and you will see you will receive the print job, hopefully, <laughs> if everything goes well. I think that that went well. It says data set printed. So as I said, we need to log out. We say print and put an A. Let's give the job of. Um, a for Apollo. Okay. Let's log out and let's keep an eye on this here. Should receive now the print job. That may have gone a little bit too quickly, but um, let's see here. Yes. So here we have the print of the that's it so let's see how this looks it's okay but it doesn't look great uh, as you can see here I don't like this so it's better than what we had before with uh, the tabs removed but I think the tab yeah this is this is not good this is not good enough for Moshix, and so we'll have to keep on working on that. Uh, one more way to do this is to, well, we have the, um, there's a program called Aqua, um, ZOS Explorer Aqua. It's free by IBM, and you can connect with it to a mainframe and you can work with local files and the and the data sets remotely as you can see here um, so i think um, after speaking also with sebastian who made the video on this channel 
he uh, copied all the flights database and so he must have had the same problem of formatting from ASCII to EBCDIC without breaking up the formatting. So all the content is there, it's just the format is wrong. So I think what we came up with is that we just put all the 91 files into one file and then using ZOS Explorer we copied over to a single sequential data set. So I just did it here through this interface. Um, and let's see how this looks. So let's go look at this. Um, yes, so this looks much, much better. As you can see here, the formatting is all correct of the assembler, of the guidance computing computer assembler. The last revision was July 14, 1969, so shortly before the landing on the moon. I mean, this is an important year, 50 years since the landing on the moon. And we're here to witness it. I mean, this is an extraordinary time in the history of humankind. It's been only 50 years since we were able to land on a, on a, uh, on a body outside Earth. Isn't this incredible? I mean, to me, this is just amazing. And this is the software that made it possible in assembler, my favorite language. So as you can see here, some of the language here is very similar to the S360 because the, IB, the guidance computer was actually made by IBM. So they took some elements of the architecture of the S360. All right, so this looks perfect. So how do we print this? So there's one quick way to print this, which is to just say P. And maybe we make this blue so we can keep it apart from the others. I like blue stripe better. Um, and when I worked in mainframes back in the 80s, in the military, we actually used blue stripe, uh, not green stripe. Uh, green stripe was more for COBOL, and uh, we work with PL1, so maybe that's why. I don't know. Okay, so it's still connected. Um, let's put this here on the side. Maybe we can remove this also by now. And let's make this a little bit bigger. So now we have data that we can print. Let's print this out, but I also want to use a batch program to print it. Because if you print it like this, you'll have always the data set name at the top of each page, which um, which is not perfect in my eyes. So as soon as we're done with this, we're going to get, uh, we're going to write the little batch program to process this and print it out. And also when we process it in batch, we should get the immediate print out without having to uh, go through the log off procedure. This should be done in any second now. As you can see, it's 4.34 a.m. I've been working on this now for about 18 hours, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, not that simple to get nicely formatted ASCII reports to go into EPSIDIC mainframes and keep the formatting right. Not at all simple. Okay, so this print, this is done. It will, it will print now the next time we log out of TSO. But let me go and make a little uh, job. Print it. And I have it here somewhere. And so we have to put in here uh, Moshix Luminary. And remember, we're only doing the landing, the lunar landing code, not the other code of the commanding module. Okay. Uh, this position equals share. Okay. Print. We get a job card. Okay. So we put it into class A. And 
this should just work. Let's uh, go check again the name. Yeah, let's copy here for good measure. Yes. So let's see what comes out. Let's keep an eye on this part here. Yes, it's receiving it. Of course, it's a bigger print job. And let's go to prints. Okay, so that's it. I like it in blue better. We can try the same thing in green, just so we can compare it to each other. But you can see here I have the 1403 uh, uh, font. Let's go green. Apply. And let's run it again. Let's say... Luminary GDC. Okay, it's receiving now. Let's go open it. Okay, now I'll let you judge which one you like better. This, go full screen, this output. As you can see now, it's perfectly formatted. Fantastic. That's the way I want it. If you like it like this, I guess it, it's a question of what you're more used to, or this. I personally think this looks better, more professional. This looks a little bit too cobbly for me. Uh, I was never much of a COBOL programmer, as you all know. But what I like about this print is that it says here now Luminary, Job 14A3, and here it only says Moshik. So um, I think I'll, I, I will, what I'll do is I'll print up both in green stripe and, and green stripe and make it available um, for you to download. Um, I'll put the link in the description below this video so you're welcome to download it and print it out on your own printers and then you have the full code of the luminary uh, landing code. Now one thing we want to do is look, we, I promised that I would, would look in this video of what caused the 1202 error during the final stages of landing on the moon. As you can see here, it's executive overflow, no core sets. And I did some research on what this was, is that there, were, there was not enough processing power to process all the interrupts coming in. And um, even though I'm not an expert on the guidance computer, what I think what, what happened is I looked through this in, in, in detail and I also read some wiki pages, but I'm not sure. Um, and maybe there's some experts who were more into this than I am. But what happened is that they left the coupling radar on once they decoupled from the commanding module um, on Apollo 11. And so the coupling radar was still, was still pinging to see the proximity of the commanding module. And so that was using some processing power. And, uh, and during the final aspects of landing, it also had to measure ground elevation as well as lateral speed, acceleration. And so all these measurements were just a little bit too much for the, for the guidance computer to process. And so 1202 means it was just dropping interrupts. That's how I read it. But again, I'm not an expert and I welcome input in the comments below this video on on the, on if, if you know if I read this right or not here you have the formula by the way very simple formulas and one more thing I would like to mention we like to calculate pi to millions of digits below be, um, behind the comma 
Did you know that uh, NASA for the last 50 years has been operating with six digits of pi uh, behind the coma? That's all they work on, six digits of pi, uh, which is enough to get us far, far, far beyond the uh, solar system within our galaxy and still navigate correctly. So you don't need more than six or seven digits to navigate within our yeah, with our galaxy. I think you can navigate to the other end of the of the universe with I think 10 or 11 uh, uh, digits be, uh, uh, behind the coma on Pi. So um, just just saying. Um, so this video is not as much as about how we got this printed, but also about the amazing code that landed uh, people on the moon as a human, as a, as a programmer, as an American. I am so proud of what we accomplished, and um, and so uh, this is just simply amazing that we have the code here to look at and understand, and it's very simple code. By the way, um, one page of exec of code is about one millisecond of execution time. That's what Don Isles told us. So uh, hopefully he will see this video and he will correct me uh, everywhere I'm wrong. But I'm very, very proud that we have the printout of Luminary. Now I think the only remaining thing is to print out the Comanche, which is the command module software, which is, of course, very different. There it's about going around the moon and going back to Earth. But I will do this as well, and then I will print it out at my local printer. And then I will have both the command module software as well as the landing module software. Um, and I will bind it, and I will... Uh, spiral it and uh, maybe something to hand over to our kids i mean who knows if uh, 20 30 40 years from now people will be able to still print out uh, this kind of stuff maybe yes maybe no i mean this is important enough historically maybe somebody will undertake it just like 10 15 years ago somebody undertook to take it from print out and uh, and put it back again into ascii code and now we've done it uh, I don't know, uh, maybe for the first time in 50 years back into EPSIDIC code. Uh, I will also, for people who send me an email or inquire me on uh, uh, on, on our Moshix channel on Facebook, I will also send the data set. It's rather, rather large because, as you know, it's 91 data sets, but um, I'm also willing to make the, uh, the mainframe EPSIDIC coded data sets available in this kind of format i think i may be wrong but this is the first time in 50 years that uh, the assembler is back again uh, in epsidy code on the mainframe as it was uh, just before the moon landing so uh, with this uh, let's just reflect again on the huge accomplishment of humankind of engineering computer science and the ibm s360 architecture the mainframes that put um, mankind on the moon one little step for man but one giant step for computer science and for the s360 thank you very much and goodbye